proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today is something of a momentous occasion because it's the first time I've ever had all three of my land yachts together in the same place. Yeah, because I've owned the Volvo for a long time, the Mercedes for a long time, the Crown Vic for, well, less of a long time, but all three of them share one defining characteristic, and that is they are a four-door, three-box saloon, which is frankly ridiculous in size, and is standout in quality for its own unit, or oh, actually very similar set of reasons. Basically, these are all three of the most indestructible cars in the world, ignoring the fact that this one is fairly well destructed at the moment. However, these are cars with reputations for lasting forever, and, you know, they go on and on and on, and I don't think I could live long enough to drive all three of these into the ground. So, this is the first time because the Crown Vic has been at home because it doesn't fit in the barn. People often ask me, will the Crown Vic go into the barn? No, it won't go through the door. It's too long for the straight bit by the door. Incidentally, so is the Volvo. That has to go in at a 90 degree angle. It won't make the turn. That will never go in the barn. It won't even go up the lane to the farm where the barn is. It's too big. Um, <laughs> so that has not met the Volvo, which has been at the barn for absolutely months. I haven't taxed every month for the last couple of months. I've said, I'm gonna tax it this month, I'll get it out, and then midway through the month rolls around and I haven't taxed it and I've gone, oh, do you know what? I'm two weeks into the month, I'm not gonna waste half a month tax for a car I can barely drive for any two weeks, and left it. And this month I've gone, no, I'm gonna do it. It got to like the 10th, and what day is it now, the 17th? It was a couple of days ago, and I thought, do you know, oh, I keep looking at this car, I keep thinking I need to drive it, so I went and stuck tax on it, dragged it out of the barn. The Alpha is back over in the barn now because that is riddled with more problems as always, and the Volvo naturally having sat basically been shuffled around inside the barn once or twice but basically i haven't driven it since about christmas time so it's about six months off the road turn the key boom off it went and it drove here happy as larry there is something rather magical about that anyway that hasn't been home in all time the crown vic's been here meanwhile i've been ignoring the mercedes um i'll, I'll talk through all three of these cars in a second because they've all got plans and stuff to do and I might as well start with this one because I'm over here. Right. This so this thing, if you're new to the channel, is a 1983 Mercedes W123 230E. It's a fuel-injected car, which means it's got the... Oh, can I open that up? Bosch K-Jetronic Mechanical Fuel Injection, which, if you cast your mind back to about two years ago, I actually completely rebuilt that fuel system, which Bosch say you can't do. It turns out you can, but it's not much fun. Anyway, this now starts on the button. If you catch a moment of this a few moments ago. Now the first thing to do with the W123 is to fit a new battery. My word, these things are heavy. Now I forget the actual chain of thefts that order they went in, but I needed a battery for the Tourer, so I stole the battery out of the Tourer. Then I needed a battery for the Bubble 200VI, so that the battery out of this got passed around from car to car to car. And this came from a scrapyard two or three days ago. Unfortunately, it turns out it's too tall. I've just discovered, um, which is doubly annoying because the price of scrapyard batteries have gone up. Because everything else has got expensive, the guy in the scrapyard was saying that people are now taking the batteries off their cars when they scrap them and keeping them. So they only had one in stock and that was it. 30 quid for a UASA, what model is this? HSB030 is still really good. However, it's a shame it doesn't actually fit the car. Um, so I wonder if I can get this to fit into one of the other vehicles, maybe the 420 Tourer will accept it. Um, anyway, um, yeah, at least it'll get this thing started and running so I can move this up the drive today. Now, question is, will this thing actually start? And I've got to say, being in it is vaguely terror inducing because the number of cobwebs is horrific. And I saw a big bad boy spider in here. It has not run in a long time. I'm not sure there's any petrol in it anymore. It may have just evaporated or fallen out. Yeah, the fuel gauge is not moving. Oh, I've not got a throttle attached to the floor either at the minute, so... Uh, oh, it just started. The battery had come disconnected. And it is now alive! Mercedes quality. You cannot fault it. All right, let's take this very brakeless run up the drive. I'm touching the foot brake like it's going to do something. That really rolls off. Okay, let's try that again. This time not fully releasing the handbrake. Christ. 
I'm gonna stop it just there, I think. That'll do. Yeah, so no brakes makes moving it rather hairy, but the thing, it does work. Now, people keep asking when I'm gonna get back onto it, and the thing is, a little while ago, a friend of mine who is like a semi-professional welder said we'll take this up to his unit we'll get it welded he would do the work and it'd take a couple of days to get all the patching and paneling done and it'll be you know, professionally done basically the problem is he's been very busy i've been very, very busy we have not had time to be able to get this thing between the two of us up to his place and get on with it um no fault of his no fault of mine it's just life gets in the way i think he was on holiday for quite a long time then he had a couple of weeks away at work and just all, all kinds of stuff so anyway i've now invested in a better angle grinder, a better cutoff tool. I'm gonna to have a stab hopefully this weekend. I'll show you actually some more bits I've been buying for it. Yeah, I've been buying buying stuff for all the cars basically. I'll start off with the fact that this has now got a safari roof, like on a Land Rover, keeps it cool in this hot weather. I did sand down this corner of the bonnet a little while ago, but as you look at it, it's actually not completely straight. Um, this corner has had a minor knock. That wing was very rusty. It showed quite a bit of damage. I've binned it off. This bonnet wasn't going to match up correctly to a new wing. So when this new bonnet came up on Facebook for 50 quid, plus shipping obviously, um, I jumped on it. It's got a little bit of surface rust on the inside, but obviously it needs to be painting the right color. This is petrol metallic blue, a beautiful shade. Um, I can transfer, well, I'll transfer this grill off. This grill's a bit manky, so I'll get a new grill and I'll transfer that onto there. And then we will have a much nicer front end, which actually matches up when I put a new wing on there. Now, speaking of wings, this is a complete rear wing lower for the driver's side. This is new metal, shiny and lovely. And I'll go and show you why I require that. Okay, last time I looked at this car and I started grinding back the filler and finding more and more filler, I was finding more and more holes. And what I discovered was this has been repaired in the past. I don't know if this is done and left like this or if this is just corroded ever since, but basically this entire lip around the arch is new metal and it's not a great fit. Incidentally, it's also rusty down here and it's rusty down there. And so I figured the best thing to do when it's rusty under there is cut it off underneath this swage line or at least a straight line down here somewhere. I think probably follow the swage line that we can cover the join with this trim and then replace the entire lower quarter and that'll make a much neater job of it. So yeah, that is the Mercedes where it stands at the moment. Amazing how it starts, it jumps into gear, happy as you like and flies off. Um, kind of hard to control because I haven't refitted the uh, I've not refitted the accelerator pedal and the brakes still don't work because they're all the bits are in boxes in the garage floor. So yeah, very much work in progress, trying to keep my enthusiasm up with this one. That kind of stuff really doesn't help me. All right, next up, let's take a look at the Crown Victoria. Now you know this car well, I've been following it a lot on the channel recently. Uh, ooh, a bird pooped on it. Um, it has got a couple of little minor issues which I need to get looked at and so for that we will leave the comfort of the driveway and join past me out in East Kent. Hello welcome to Furious Driving and today we're back at Classic Car Restorations down here in Kent who won an award last year for the uh, Capri Minder uh, Capri which we followed for several months. That's Tony lurking in the background over there and I've brought down today the Crown Victoria, favourite in the fleet at the moment, which is a wonderful car, but has got a few cosmetic, little not quite perfect uh, which need looking at. And there is a man here who is perfect to do the job. Go on, Tony, what do you reckon? Not a lot. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony wasn't exactly uh, complimentary of this thing. <laughs> He's used to what he calls real Fords over there, but... I'm not enthused. <laughs> I must say. No, it's fantastic, it's right. Tony. It's doable. It's yeah. all doable, isn't it? It's nothing problem at all. So what do you reckon? Wings off or do it on the car? Do them on the car. Yeah. Do you reckon there's anything lurking underneath it to what you've seen of it? No, it's all pretty solid. A little bit there. I think it's, no, it's solid. It'll enough. sand back and then you'll just sort it out. We've got a little bit of gremlins over here. Yeah, that might turn into a little hole. Yeah, let's have to fill that and sort that out. Yeah, maybe just weld a little plate in there or something. Yeah. The bumper maybe will do because that's got a few scuffs in it from 
character. It's character, yeah. Well, the thing is, in a, in a way, I'm loath to sort of paint out the character and the history of the car because that's all done on active service when it was an actual police car and you don't know if it was a parking bump or if it was someone, you know, arresting someone and shoving them into the whatever. But on the other hand, though, it might be someone putting their lunch on there and scratching it, so... Do you reckon yeah. that's um, polishable out? These little marks, or is that too deep, do you reckon? Oh, the old lick test. Yeah, I think they'll go. Yeah? Well, they certainly fade a lot. Yeah. And this wing isn't rusty, but it's kind of flat. It's got a little pimpling on it. Well, they've painted it. Oh, yeah, that's a nice paint job, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looks like one of my own ones. <laughs> so we'll blow in this last, wing as well. That was the last week, Joe. Yeah. You're going to end up going down both sides of it to get the colour right. What do you reckon, doing right. the entire, entire both sides in the yeah. end? Yeah. Oh, okay. What about that bit there, then? That's not even off the same car, is it? Well, I don't know. I reckon it's that plastic, and that's faded differently over no, time. No, it's just been painted, and well, why it hasn't it? got any paint on it, has it? Oh, I think it oh, still okay. see the primer through it. Oh, when they've taken, yeah, when they've done the wing, they've... darker on the edge there. Oh, they yeah, I never noticed that. Oh, professional mm. either. Well, so I saw the car, I assumed it was because it was plastic and it just faded weirdly over the years. It's plastic, it's metal, isn't oh, it? Oh, is it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But I reckon they've taken that out and painted it and... I think that's what's happened, isn't it? So you reckon we'd have to do both, both sides to match the colours in? Yeah. Because this one, this is the worst bit, visibly. Well, they've got overspray all over it, haven't they? Look. Yeah. I mean, do you reckon that'll polish out, that'll be a... Yeah. Go around the sides. No, I'll go around the... Do it all properly. Yeah. Do the both sides, it's job done, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And do the bumpers as well while we're there, or do you Maybe. Not... We'll see what you think when it's... You want to do that back corner, don't you? Yeah. There's a few little hazy cracks on the thing. We start getting carried away. We're I know, it's a problem, isn't it? We're going to end up doing the bonnet as I well, know. aren't we? We'll be we painting the whole thing in a minute. Do you reckon that can be touched in, or do you reckon that can be... No. That's going to look worse if you put a... Yeah, so what kind of money do you reckon that would be? I'm millions. Millions, more than the car's worth. Yeah. Most of my cars, that normally is the case. So if I quote you heavy, does it mean I don't have to do it? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, so leave it, we'll leave it at that, then. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Yes. I only got this car into the country. I bought this car back in September. It didn't arrive till Christmas and then it wasn't on the road until sort of March time because of all the paperwork. So I've only had it on the road a couple of months. I don't want to take it off again into the body shop. Yeah. I want to use it for summertime and then sort of look at it over winter time. But you yeah, reckon it's not too bad though. I reckon we could sort that out and yeah, fill in this little dent here and stuff. And, it's all doable, isn't it? Yeah, to make it look... It's quite nice really compared to some of the stuff that comes well, through the true, door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not too big of a job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're European Ford, so that's kind of what your bread and yeah. butter is now, isn't it? So, yeah. But yeah, I'm alright yeah. with an Escort. <laughs> well, this is about the size of three Escorts. But. Looks like one of them horrible Granada Ultimus things on steroids. Oh, the Scorpios, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember them? They were horrible, <laughs> weren't they? <laughs> I love the fact I turned up here. He, he's had a go at me for bringing some big silly American thing. His neighbours had a go at me for not being an old enough American thing. I'm doing well here. But you've got something else around here that showed me while I'm here today. You've uh, got a new toy. Yeah, I have. No, it even well, matches your T-shirt. Yeah, well, it's the wife's. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I wanted an Escort twin cam, but it was never going to happen, so... You buy, you buy a project, you never finish a project, well, you never drive if it. Well, if I bought one that had been done, it wouldn't be good enough, would it, so... You'd have still taken it apart. Yeah. So this is going to be coming up in a very future video, a very soon future video. Quite an exciting, interesting... If Bumblebee was European... We've got a bit of, a bit of fluff on that. If Bumblebee was European, it would be... Now, if you're wondering why I want to take the Crown Vic to this place, well, you saw the minder we did last year, but check out the bottom of this Escort. This is better paint underneath it than you'll find on the top of a lot of other cars that just come out of a body shop. So this is how I want the Crown Vic to look. Oh, look at this thing. Look at the colour of this and the shininess of it. It is better than factory. I mean, if you had this on the top side of your Mark 1 or 2 Escort, you'd be more than proud to take it to a show, but this is the floor that no one's ever going to see. This is basically why the Minder Capri won lots of awards last year. That looks so good. So it's going back in the paint shop for the top soon then. Yes, next on the agenda, I've got to do inside engine bay and the boot, and then we're going to do the outside, and then 
make a very pretty curl. Yeah, that is. It's an unusual colour. What is it called? Mink blue. Mink blue. I don't think I've ever seen a mink blue escort. Well, ironically, that Cortina up there, the Mark II GT that was up the top of the unit, was just oh, yeah. same colour. Oh, really? So having a bit of a run on it at the yeah. moment. <laughs> you bought in bulk then. Yeah. <laughs> get a discount. <laughs> so I'll do so, the Crown Vic in mink blue as well. Do I get it cheaper? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get the leftovers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put some blue stripes up the side of it or something. Oh yeah, I pretend it's a cop car. <laughs> so Tony was mildly disparaging of the car. He's going to get back to me with a price, but uh, his ultimate opinion was that in order to get the best look on this thing, we're going to have to repaint the entirety of both sides so we get the perfect blend and make the thing look, well, as good as it possibly can. But whether we just do local repairs or as he would suggest, and he's the expert, the entire sides, I'm not going to do it until well, winter time at the very earliest because I've not had this car on the road very long. I've only had it about three or four months, I think. No, probably about three months driving. Longer, obviously, on the drive. But I don't want to be missing out on all the times I could be out on a day like today, enjoying it, taking it to shows and stuff. So we'll get it booked in when the weather turns nasty in the winter time. At least I'll know very soon how much I need to budget for because obviously a car this big is, is going to take a lot of paint. And we don't know quite how bad, you never know how bad bodywork's gonna be until you start delving in. That's one thing I have learned over the years, doing my own work and also having work paid for and watching other people's work being done, is that no matter how optimistic you hope a job will be and how little extra that you're gonna find, there's always something. It's never an easy job. There's always just one more little thing that just needs to be sorted out. Next things to be doing on this car, well, I might change the rear suspension out. The shocks and springs just feel a little bit more bouncy than I would like. They're still well within tolerance, but sometimes you go over a bump and the whole back of the car wibbles and skips in a slightly done, disconcerting manner. But before I do that, I am going to get it up to a gearbox specialist I've been told about by other members of the Crown Victoria groups, the American and, and service uh, car group. Uh, gearbox specialist in the Midlands. He does good flush, so we're going to take it for a good flush and get the thing sorted out so that the gearbox keeps on rocking on as well. I don't like automatics much. This is one of the most crude and lumpy automatics you can drive. I mean, it's very smooth, proper old fashioned slush box smooth, but it's done 81,000 miles, so it's bound to be due for a bit of attention. So that's two out of three cars. Third one is the Volvo, which we have not seen in absolutely months, apart from in the background over in the barn. Now this is an amazing thing, which I bought just prior to the first lockdown in 2020 for a cheap car challenge, sub 500 pound MOT'd um, fixed car, paid 175 pounds for this thing with 140 something thousand miles on the clock. It's got nearly 147 now on it. And um, one owned from new, full service history, incredible as it was it needed some rust which wasn't going to make it through the next mot but it was long enough to get through the cheap car challenge but that never happened because lockdown happened so i spent all of lockdown welding the floor and now here we are but it does have a few little minor niggles on it these little bits of rust which i've been meaning to look at for absolutely ages ignoring for months i should have done it when they're in the barn spot there spot there um little spot um down here under the rubber needs boot rubber taking out this needs sorting out just bits and pieces sorting out on this car. The main thing that's bogging me with this car really is the lack of A post trim and C post trim because I took the headlining out and redid the headlining and this old plastic shattered and I bought a new one of these A post trims and it just vanished. I had no idea what it was until a few minutes ago because I was just opening up the back of this car. Oh my God, look at those cobwebs. And I found this on the back seat of the Volvo and the Mercedes. It's gray rather than blue, but honestly, these things are so rare. Beggars, choosers, you know the routine. Let's see finally if this actually fits. This is not the easiest thing in the world to do. I've got to be honest. Line up a big wobbly thing that's probably going to crack and break. The main thing is I'm getting this rubbery thing, rubber ducting through this little hole. And once that's through there, I can concentrate on lining up all the other bits behind other trim well there we go that is a significant upgrade in the look and feel of the interior of this car still need, still need to find one for that rear three-quarter however even though this is slightly darker gray than this is blue it's a really quite a close match so you barely don't notice it yeah i'd much rather see that than the uh the painted metal behind and the wires and stuff so yeah a result
And because this hasn't been out on the road in quite a while, I'll take this for a short drive and take you out in it and show you what it's like. Incidentally, in honor of this day, I am wearing my Volvo 740 t-shirt, which is available on the Furious Driving website linked underneath. And these hats, Furious Driving baseball caps, because frankly, it's unpleasantly warm, are also gonna be available there anytime now, as soon as I get around to doing that. The old unmistakable red block sound is getting on the road. Let's show you what it's like. I must say, it does feel nice to be back behind the wheel of this thing even though I'm having to drive with the windows down because it is unbearably hot today. I think they're saying it's the hottest day of the year so far, 30 plus degrees around the southeast of England. So yeah, this is what we're going to talk about. The similarities and differences of my barge fleet. I, I could literally start a shipping company with the contents of my drive. The things I've got in common is they're all four-door saloons. They're all massive. They're all ridiculously over-engineered for one reason or another. The Crown Vic is over-engineered. A working police car has to have the hardest life of any vehicle on the, on the road. It's got worse even than a taxi. It's got people going in the back every day who don't want to be there, who will be sick on the floor, and it's got to drive into other stuff from time to time. It's, it's a tough life. It's got to be over-engineered. The Volvo is designed to cope with Swedish winters, driving to within the Arctic Circle and just starting every day in some of the harshest environments on the planet. It's designed to cope with that. And the W123 was designed at a time when Mercedes-Benz was a byword for ultimate quality. Now it, if you bought a Mercedes, you knew you could drive that car forever. And the W123 is possibly the highlight and the pinnacle of that. It's where the technology with things like the mechanical fuel ejection, anti-lock brakes were on it. The car cost as much as a well, medium-sized house in 1983 when it was new. Admittedly, houses were a lot cheaper then, but you know, the point still stands. So that's the similarities, but the differences though are, well, there's quite a few, believe it or not. And all of them ride with that ridiculous, wobbly, boat-like wobble and waft. The Crown Vic is possibly the least wobbly, despite being an American barge, because it's got the police interceptor package, so although the thing does roll quite a lot, it's quite tightly controlled on its police spec springs, cop motor, cop shocks and all that. But starting with the Crown Vic, that one perhaps feels, I don't know, I was going to say the most modern, but it doesn't feel a lot more modern than this one, which is about 13, no, 14 years its senior. But it does have stuff like air conditioning and cruise control, which just make it feel so much more comfortable on a day like today. It's also an automatic, which I'm not a huge fan of at the best of times. And I've often criticized autos and yeah, I'm just generally not a fan of them. And that particular one is, let's be honest, a dreadful automatic. It's a proper old school slush box that slurs through the gears. And um, yeah, it doesn't really help the performance or the economy, but it's part of the character of the car. It wouldn't be a Crown Vic if it had a decent gearbox. So yeah, but that car is huge. I thought this car was big until I drove the Crown Vic and realized this is small fry. The Crown Vic is proper big. Then there is this car, which is a manual. It's got a proper five-speed gearbox. It's a bit of a notchy old box. It's nicer once it's warmed up. Oh, it's a Rolls-Royce wedding car. That's gonna be a warm day in that thing. Old ghost. So yeah, this thing does roll like crazy. It's also a heck of a lot slower than the Crown Vic. And you might expect that because this is a, a two, oh God, what is that? I forgot what size the engine is. Just over two liters, 2.1 or 2.3 or something. 2.3, I think. Uh, it's the four cylinder red block. Whereas the Crown Vic is a 4.6 V8. Although bizarrely, and a few people have, have called me out saying I'm lying or I'm wrong on comments, this thing is thirstier than the Crown Vic. So yeah, the Crown Vic has the edge for air conditioning, cruise control, better economy and faster. But this is an awful lot of fun to be in and you get a lot of smiles when you're out and about in this car because people absolutely love an old Volvo brick. Now finally, and it's kind of hard to compare this one because I haven't actually driven it anywhere yet beyond up and down the drive in a mildly terrifying, out of control, no brakes manner. And that is the W123. Another outlived the cockroaches car. Doesn't have aircon or cruise, but should be a very luxurious car. It's the only one with a sunroof. It's an automatic again. I think it's a four speed, but the Crown Vic's a four speed with overdrive. That one's just a basic four speed. I've no idea how good it will be, but I suspect 
we're going to be talking old school slush box again and I suspect it's going to be fairly slow. I think it's going to be a race for the bottom between the, the Volvo and the Mercedes when it comes to who is the least performance orientated. At least the police interceptor is designed to be a fast car. Wow, this thing does roll like crazy. But I think really my favourite, if I'm honest, is the Crown Vic. It's the history of the car. It's built for such a specific purpose, and I'm a big fan of that kind of engineering. It makes it very interesting to me, even if it is the least practical. If I was going to have to get rid of one of them, that's a tough choice. I think it's safe to say it wouldn't be the Vic. Love that one. Um, but I'm not liking automatics very much. I think it might be the W123 got the boot because this has got a proper gearbox in it. So that does give it an edge in my eyes, despite the fact the Merc is perhaps the top, I don't know, the more valuable of the cars? It's hard to say, really. Car values are in such a crazy place right now, I really don't know. Oh, let's get back to the driveway. I'm going to sit in the Crown Vic with the air conditioning turned on. That's another advantage of that car. It's got the most powerful air conditioning of anything I think I've ever sat in. So here we have three ridiculous barges, which are all very much serving the same purpose in life, but are all quite different in character. So it's a a weird and interesting collection. I wonder if I'm the only person in the UK or the world who owns a Crown Vic, a 740, and a W123. If anyone else has got this same collection, then let me know. It was quite fun at the Furious Driving Social up at the Motorist when, bizarrely, out of the blue, a Crown Vic, well, Mercury Grand Marquis, and a 740 and an Alpha 145 turned up, and it was almost like my car collection was being reassembled by strangers for me um, in a car park miles from home. Here, I've done it myself today, and it's something I've not done before. It does look rather good, doesn't it? So I hope you've enjoyed this little look around this collection or part of the collection of cars. I'll bring the hot hatches together next time because that'll be quite fun. So yeah, if you've enjoyed, as always, like, subscribe, head down to the Furious Driving merch store to grab yourself a hat, t-shirt, stickers, other stuff. Or if you're not in the UK or haven't got the sizes you want, then head over to the Redbubble store, also in the link below. As always, like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. And I'm now going to consider whether it's too hot to even think about starting to do welding today. I think it might be. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk.